All right, so picking back up from where we left off in uh, section one, uh, we kind of left off talking about that photo period, um, the photo period and how we can influence that day length in order to kind of trick or manipulate the plant into doing what we want it to do when we want it to do, uh, when we want to do it. Uh, so in those, so kind of the, why that works is because if we're going to produce one of those proteins, remember we talked about that phytochrome or that cryptochrome uh, is going to have some influence on the plant. Uh, so, th so those proteins are what is going to initiate or kind of signal to the apical meristem that it is time for you to uh, um, change from uh, juvenile to mature cells and so that we can start initiating this flower. So the flower primordium is going to be the initial flower parts and then an um, anthesis is when the flower actually opens. Um, and that's all kind of about uh, going into growth. Um, that, that time to anthesis is going to be uh, species or cultivar dependent and then also based on temperature, whether that's warm season or cool season. So obviously this would be obviously um, uh, this would be a little bit different if we had a cool season plant, uh, but I would think up to a certain point, right? So if it's too cold, then the flowers won't bloom. So there has to be some kind of a balance, um, and it needs to be like consistent. So for pollination, uh, there are three types of pollination that we can have. Uh, we have this transfer from the anther to the stigma. So there can be self-pollination, and that is, the, that is the same flower pollinates, or so the pollen from the anther within the same flower pollinates the, um, the stigma. We can have same plant and different flower, or we can be from different flowers of the same clone. And then cross pollination is kind of, kind of self-explanatory, right? Uh, that's going to be from two separate flowers, so having two different genetics. Uh, within that self-pollination, uh, we will have like self-fertile, um, and then also self-sterile. And so this kind of goes um, into into what we would consider kind of like inbreeding. Like there's a reason why inbreeding does not work, like why there's a problem and we need to um, reproduce with, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go back to humans, right? We are needing to reproduce with someone that is not in our family tree because eventually the inbreeding depression will happen and we'll start to have um, some deformities or some mutations of those genes and then those plants will not, humans or plants will not continue their life cycle. Right, those genetics have now been um, mutated uh, because they're not supposed to mix with the same bloodline. Again, sometimes we can have that in plants and sometimes, sometimes it's a problem and sometimes it isn't. Almost all the time in humans, it's a problem, okay? Um, so we have self-fertile, they will sell, um, set seed, self-sterile, so the plant knows that it's, it, that it's its own genetics. So when we have the stamen that gives pollen into the stigma, goes down the style into the ovary, the ovary can recognize that it's from its own bloodline or own genetics, and it will not fertilize that egg. Or it, maybe it will, um, um, uh, it will fertilize it, but no seed will set. Pollinating agents, some of the things that are going to help that cross-pollination, kind of some common sense things, bees, uh, wind, water. We have two plants that are close to each other, or two flowers. The rain splashes, sends up that pollen over, and some of it transfers onto a neighboring flower. So here we have this cross section um, of a um, 
a pistol. Here down here we have the ovary and the style and the stigma. So the pollen coming from a bird or a bee or some insect drops the pollen onto the stigma. That pollen grows down the style into the ovary and then fertilizes that egg. Uh, so the egg has this kind of um, this sixth sense about what will and won't fertilize an egg. So in angiosperms, uh, that pollen tube, this being the pollen tube right here that goes all the way down to the, to the ovary. So when that pollen grain goes on to the stigma, it will grow down the style and into the ovule. It is going to discharge two sperm nuclei, each with one set of chromosomes into the embryo sac. So we have one end from the sperm nuclei and one end from the ovule. They are going to join or combine to create a two-end zygote. Y'all, this is, this is very similar to what happens when humans reproduce, that when sperm enters the ovary of a female, there's an egg, and that sperm, egg, unite and create an embryo. Same principle in plants. The other, um, the other one end sperm nuclei will bond with uh, the polar nuclei to create a three end endosperm that then becomes food for the zygote. Uh, and cone-bearing gymnosperm is not something that we're really going to get into. Uh, they still kind of have the same principle where the pollen tube um, lands directly on the ovule and that sperm travels into the, travels through the pollen tube, through the covering and into the egg. And then we have this thing called parthenocarpy. Parthenocarpy. And this is where a fruit is going to develop without being pollinated or fertilized. And so there are no seeds. So once that um, zygote starts to form, we have fruit begin. The enlarged ovary is actually the fruit. The other flower parts become what is commonly considered to be the fruit. Um, and then um, the mechanism for that is largely unknown, uh, but those hormones can substitute for fertilization uh, to get fruit set in some species. Something else that's going to go into this is also going to be the number and the quality of the fruit set. So if we have too many fruit, we'll have low quality and low value. And the reason for this, so also um, I'll go back to my uncle Satsuma farm. Um, so not only will, so we have March, the temperatures start to warm up. The trees put out as many flowers as there are buds. If there's a bud, there's going to be a there. There should be a flower, um, and there are many buds on many trees. So those flowers will come up, and at some point in time, some of the flowers will drop. Like the plant just cannot maintain so many flowers. There's only so many that it can provide enough nutrition for. So. Some of the flowers will drop, the rest of them will get pollinated, uh, and they will start to set fruit. At some point in time, there might even be a fruit drop. So if you have too many fruit on a tree, they're going to be thin, uh, they're going to be, uh, they might end up being watery or enlarged, or they might be too small, uh, because there's just not enough energy and nutrition, uh, there's not enough uh, water photosynthates in order to support that. So what we want is a nice balance 
where most of the photosynthase from the leaves can be directed into the fruit. So we want to have uniform fruit on a nice balance on a tree so that we can have this juicy orange or satsuma or apple or whatever um, that comes off and is actually worth selling. So you might see where we start to thin some of this, some of these kind of smaller ones. Uh, maybe Dr. Um, Best up at the up at the Oakley greenhouse will start to thin some of his plants to make sure that the tomatoes that are actually growing uniformly uh, get the majority of the nutrients. And so if you have if you don't have enough fruit, you may have good quality and good value, but you but you have a limited supply of them. As I mentioned, that temperature, um, if we get to be too high or too low, uh, we could cause a crop failure. Um, if we go all the way back to that temperature being too high, then remember I mentioned that like when we start getting above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, that we start to have some of that um, solarization um, uh, and we start to have some cell deterioration. And so if the conditions are too much uh, or too hot, then that process won't occur because we have those, those cellular structural issues. Light, if there's not enough light, then we don't have enough photosynthesis uh, to support our fruit crop. And then also soil moisture because soil moisture is where um, our fruits are typically watery. Um, they at least have some juice to them. That juice is a result of the water that is taken up by the plant and then also the nutrients that come with that water that are part of the soil. So now we have uh, fruit growth and development um, after fruit set. So after the, after the um, ovary has been um, fertilized and sets fruit, uh, food materials from the other parts begin to move into those developing fruit tissues. So that photosynthesis, remember I mentioned before that we have the xylem that brings nutrients from the ground to the leaves that, so, so they can perform photosynthesis. Those photosynthates are then traveled, are then carried back down to the roots to continue uh, the process and so that the roots have enough energy in order to continue bringing water and nutrients back up to the plant. At some point in time, when that switches over from vegetative production to uh, maturity, and we start having fruit production, those photosynthates, not all of them go back to the roots. Some of them will, but also some of those photosynthates are then gonna be distributed throughout the plant to those fruits. That's kind of the whole purpose of it. And so once those fruit tissues are initiated, uh, cell enlargement is actually what makes those, is actually what makes the fruit grow and get bigger. So fruits have two basic growth patterns. We have one which is a sigmoid, um, which is gonna be slow. Um, it's gonna be slow at first, then it's gonna have this uh, rapid growth period, and then it will finally decline again. Hey, think about this. This is much like us as humans, right? So um, elementary school, middle school, like elementary school, we were small. Um, somewhere between fifth and sixth grade, we might have got a little growth spurt. But somewhere over the summer, between maybe seventh and eighth or eighth and ninth, all of a sudden, you see kids just sprout up. They're just like they're tall as a beanstalk. So it's the same principle here. Uh, but, at, but at some point, um, at, so I'm 5'10", and I have not grown an inch since I became 5'10 when I was in high school, right? So uh, middle school, I mean, I'm sorry, elementary school, middle school, high school, and then that's it. I'm not going to get any taller than 5'10". Um, and then we have um, a double sigmoid pattern, which is just the same. It's just another... Uh, sigmoid growth such as what we see here so here's our first sigmoidal we have low growth a growth spurt it kind of levels off and then we'll have another growth spurt and this will end um, 
that will end the growth stage for that fruit. There are climacteric fruit. Uh, it's going to have something to do with ethylene. Um, ethylene is a is a plant hormone that uh, is primarily used for ripening uh, fruit. And so I guess when I think about um, ethylene, uh, bananas are stored in cold because uh, they don't want the ethylene to uh, produce and make those bananas ripen when they come from the when they come from uh, whatever country they are being shipped into America. But at some point in time, uh, it's kind of like if you leave um, if you leave bananas out on the counter, that ethylene production is what makes them uh, rot quicker, right? Um, if you put your bananas in a refrigerator, the skin, the, the peel will turn black, but the inside of the banana will not. Like the inside of the banana will still uh, be kind of solid like it was when you first bought them. So ethylene is what makes the fruit ripen. And then finally, the plants will age and then senesce. Um, that is when the cellular tissue breaks down and it just cannot support life anymore for that particular growing season. It might even just, um, it might even be the entire plant at the end of that life cycle, or it just might be the plant organs. So when I think about this, I think about trees. That like during the during the fall, trees will go, start to go dormant and those leaves will senesce. Like there's enough cue that tells those trees, listen, the daylight's getting shorter, um, the, the light intensity changes the photosynthetic rate, which is going to release some anthocyanins, and that is why you see the leaves change color. And then eventually they will fall. Like there's just nothing there to hold them on. Those uh, the cellular tissue is uh, the cellular and tissue is broken down, and those leaves are no longer attached to the to the branch. Some of that senescence can also be caused by pathogens or environmental stress. And so, if we if we have an environment where our plants are um, grown and that metabolic rate happens faster than what the plant can handle. Um, so if we increase the temperature, for instance, uh, for a long period of time and we give them um, enough light for a consistent period of time, that we can actually speed up the life cycle of that plant uh, because it can only have so much energy. Again, I mentioned before, there's that decline in photosynthesis and so that's our leaves falling off the tree. At some point in time, um, that energy from photosynthesis is stored to reproductive parts. Senescence can happen after pollination and fertilization um, because there's a change in those hormones. Speaking of plant hormones, <laughs> that's where we are. So these plant hormones are produced in small amounts. They do influence the growth and development and processes in other areas and they're, they're basically the chemical messengers. So that when plants start to produce these based on uh, their growth cycle, um, those are also signals and cues to say, hey, do this. The primary difference between a plant hormone and a plant growth regulator is that the hormones are actually produced by the plant. But the plant growth regulators are chemicals, so synthetic chemicals that are made to mimic those natural hormones produced by the plant. So we have five classes of plant hormones. The first one is auxins. Next is gibberellins. Cytokinins, 
ethylene. And finally, abscisic acid. And each one of these has a role in the plant in the plant's life cycle. So auxins are for cell enlargement and cell elongation. Um, this is also what promotes apical dominance. So we can apply auxins um, to initiate. Uh, so auxins can also be used for flower initiation and then also induce that fruit set and growth. So when I think about auxins, I think about that as a uh, kind of a growth hormone. We can also use um, auxins for uh, root initiation. So um, for like in the horticulture industry for propagation, uh, we can uh, dip those roots in, in an auxin, uh, plant those, and then that will uh, stimulate that root growth. We can also use them for tubers and bulbs, seed germination. It originates in the shoot apical meristem and then moves throughout the vascular tissues. Uh, there is a natural auxin, so this is what you would find in a plant, as uh, um, endoleacetic acid, so IAA, and then we will have our synthetic auxins, so our plant growth regulators uh, will be IBA, NAA, and then what we're uh, very familiar, one of the ones we're most familiar with, which is 2,4-D. Um, not that you would necessarily need to know uh, uh, the endolibutyric acid or the naphthaleniacetic acid, uh, but just to understand that IAA is a natural and that these three would be um, synthetic. Again, that's that um, adventitious root formation on the cuttings. We use IBA or NAA. As I mentioned before, 2,4-D is our auxin for weed control, typically of our broadleaf plants. Um, and then we can also use NAA for uh, tissue culture and root initiation. Next, we have the, gibberellic, um, the gibberellins, also known as GAs, and so those are going to be how we make the plant grow, how we make our stems grow, uh, through cell division and elongation, uh, sex expression, fruit growth and maturation and ripening, and then also has some uh, influence on our dormancy and seed germination. So gibberellins, uh, you know, a test question might be like, um, which of the following, which of the following plant hormones is used to influence seed and bud dormancy? Uh, here we are looking at how that gibberellin uh, influences our germination. So we have imbibition. That water is what uh, starts to um, initiate the synthesis of gibberellic acid. It triggers the allurone cells to synthesize those enzymes, which is then going to start uh, kind of uh, breaking down the starches and proteins into sugars and amino acids, and that's how the um, that's how the radical and the plumule begin to uh, grow. That's where they get the energy from. So it provides food for that embryo growth. Gibberellin is found in the embryos and the cotyledons. Uh, they have some commercial uses such as uh, increasing the fruit size for grapes, uh, seed germination, and seedling growth. Promoting flowers and cucumbers and can overcome some of that cold requirement for some plants. So as I mentioned before, how do you go about how do you go about um, cooling or chilling, you know, five acres worth of satsuma trees? 
one possible could, uh, would be spraying some gibberellic acid uh, that might help minimize or shorten uh, that cold requirement for those plants. They're used for stem elongation and let's say poinsettias or geraniums. So they're growing these poinsettias um, as trees rather than plants. So they use that gibberellic acid for this stem elongation. This stays the same, maybe actually grew a little bit bigger uh, because of this stem. So that plant went from something you would typically see in a pot to now something that you might see in a yard. Next are cytokinins. They're going to promote the cell division, so that is going to influence our plant growth. There it is again, cell enlargement and tissue differentiation. So we can kind of speed up that process early to make those plants figure out what it's going to do. Once we do that, we can then begin to manipulate the environment um, a little bit faster than what a growing season. So this is how we, uh, we can use these plant hormones um, in the manipulation of uh, ornamentals and fruits in order to match our growing season. So I have a feeling um, or an inclination uh, that you'll start to see more of this, uh, more use of these plant hormones as we move to a more controlled environment agricultural production system. Can overcome some dormancy um, and retard some of that leaf senescence. So we can, so cytokinins are also, you know, could possibly uh, keep that plant young or uh, give it enough energy so that it can uh, grow a little bit longer. We have natural cytokinins, and then we have synthetic, uh, kinetin, um, and benzyl, um, benzyladenine, or BA. We typically find that cytokinin in the embryo, uh, which makes sense, right? Because once the embryo, uh, so uh, the seed imbibes the water, that allurel layer like we talked about earlier, uh, starts to perform, um, starts to uh, synthesize that gibberellic acid. Um, and so once that, so once that sugar and starch begins to feed this embryo, those cells need to divide. And once they start to divide and elongate, that is because of the cytokine. Uh, just to look at um, uh, one commercial use for shoot induction and in tissue culture. So we want to get those plants to start to grow upwards. Uh, we might uh, um, add some cytokinin to it. Ethylene is actually the gas um, and it diffuses through the plant. So it's in those active, it's in the active meristems and here it is, as I mentioned, it's the ripening of the fruit. It's, it's, it's what ripens the fruit. So once it has reached, uh, so you wouldn't expect this to be uh, during the juvenile phase of the plant, right? We would expect this to be after the reproduction phase. So ripening of the fruit, and then finally is going to uh, kind of, it's going to be uh, involved in the senescing of the flowers and the fruit. It can be used to germinate seeds uh, because it is going to uh, activate that meristem and once that meristem is activated the, the plant will then begin to grow. So ethylene as I mentioned the fruit ripening the senescence and then the leaf abscission and abscission is where the leaf falls off like there is a separation so here we have a leaf to the petiole and at some point in time the gap between my two fingers, the cells in between that are holding those two together, they senesce and die. That is abscission. Um, I guess if you could think about, um, uh, finally, like if you, sm if you slammed your finger in a door, <laughs> I know I get out there a little sometimes. If you slammed your finger in a door and that, and that fingernail gets lost, at some point in time, it's abscission right there at the cuticle. Those cells right there are no longer alive and no longer holding that leaf to the petiole. So they use that for fruit ripening, flower initiation,
Uh, they also use it for uh, to kind of keep the fruit uniform. And they'll use this to change sex expression um, in cucumbers and pumpkins. Degreening citrus in a harvest aid, again because it's going to um, again because it is going to uh, uh, influence that leaf abscission. So it can be a defoliant. Right here we defoliate uh, field tomatoes and cotton so that we can harvest those a little bit easier. Um, I don't know. I guess that's part of the that's that that's kind of the smell of the defoliant. Being from Mississippi, I can always smell when it's time to harvest uh, either the soybean or the cotton. Uh, it does because it's a gas. It is um, there is the potential. Uh, for um, incomplete combustion of the gas and oil fire greenhouse heaters. Uh, it will get in there and, and influence the um, the gas ratio of that greenhouse heater. And then our last one is going to be abscisic acid. Uh, mostly in the regulation of seed development um, and initiate response to stress such as water stress. So uh, when the plant becomes under water stress, ABA is actually what uh, closes the guard cells that are going to um, kind of uh, encapsulate or enclose the stomata and conserve that water. So uh, if there's going to be any kind of um, stress, ABA comes to the rescue and says, nope, nope, not going not, not gonna to go through that. Um, you need to close those guard cells so that we can conserve our water. All right, so that's it for chapter seven. Um, next will be chapter eight, obviously. Um, and I think chapter eight is just going to be, um, there's only like 33 slides in it, so um, it won't be very long. All right, see you in the next chapter.